How's it going everyone and welcome back to another podcast. So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite stories from Tom Barry's book, Guerrilla Days in Ireland. So if you want early access to all these podcasts, lads, they're going to be available on my Patreon, which I'll have linked below. So let's get straight into today's story. Tom Barry gets called to GHQ in Dublin. So let's jump back to May 1921, right at the end of the War of Independence, only two months before the truce. Tom Barry, as normal, was residing in West Cork and he was leading the 3rd West Cork Brigade IRA. Tom had received two messages at this stage from the Adjutant General and those messages said that President Eamon de Valera had asked to see him. De Valera wanted a first-hand account of the military position in the south and Tom Barry was expected to report to GHQ in Dublin on the 19th of May. Although Tom was happy to be invited to GHQ and meet the president, he was not looking forward to this journey at all. Tom was a wanted man. He had organized and partook in some of the most successful ambushes of the entire war, and he was somehow going to have to travel from West Cork to Dublin without being caught or identified. Traveling by car was completely out of question. On a journey like this, he was guaranteed to be stopped and searched multiple times. So the train was the only option. But traveling by train meant that he'd have to go unarmed. An armed man would have had no chance of getting through the various military searches at the railway stations. So Tom had no experience in doing journeys like this. He was worried that his lack of experience would lead him to get getting caught essentially. How was he going to lie and bluff to various different officers the whole way to Dublin? How would he be able to pull off that he was an innocent civilian? If they found out that he was Tom Barry, commandant of the 3rd West Cork Brigade IRA, God knows what they would have done to him. So at first, he considered travelling as an engineering student of University College Cork. He had a few buddies that were engineers and they'd be able to train him and offer him advice. However, he changed his mind and he decided to go as a medical student. There were tons of medical students in his brigade, so he had no lack of coaching available. Tom's preparations for this journey were intense. He had to be able to pull off a believable, innocent civilian medical student. This was literally life or death. As he said in his own words, should I be captured and recognized, the British had enough evidence against me to rapidly arrange my exit at the end of a rope or before one of their firing squads. As I said, Tom Barry was a wanted man. He was the leader of the Kilmichael ambush in November 1920, where they killed 17 of the auxiliary division of the Royal Irish Constabulary. 17 of Britain's elite forces lay dead on the roads at the hand of Tom Barry's flying column. Yeah, you can see why Tom was hesitant to be caught by any British officer, right? So Tom's medical student comrades coached him. They supplied him with notes on medicine, textbooks, any other kind of paraphernalia used in the possession of a second year medical student. Some friends of Barry gave him a hat, shoes, shirts, socks and pyjamas. Kathleen O'Connell of the Come and the Man organised to get Tom a suit and he was supposed to collect it at headquarters in Cahara in Skibbereen on the 16th of May, just before he was to leave for Dublin. So Tom arrived back in Skibbereen on the morning of the 16th after travelling all night. He was wrecked tired and he went straight to bed. He slept in a small tent, he was rolled up in a few army blankets. The tent was situated about 250 yards from a friendly farmhouse and it was essentially camouflaged from briars and ditches. Fairly rough way to sleep, but it had to be done. He couldn't stay in the farmhouse as was a known area that the IRA would hang out. They used to eat a lot of their meals in that farmhouse and the British knew about it. After a few hours sleep, he was frantically awoken and given the news that there was a big column of British soldiers a few hundred yards down the road and that they were inquiring for Tom Barry by name. So Tom rapidly got dressed. He didn't make any further inquiries. He grabbed his arms and his equipment and he ran as fast as he could in the opposite direction of the enemy. Luckily, he got away. But later that day, he got some bad news. Those British soldiers from earlier that day had caught a local IRA scout that was carrying Tom Barry's clothes for his trip to Dublin. The clothes were wrapped in brown paper with Tom Barry's name and rank clearly written on it. So that's why the British soldiers were inquiring for Tom by name. It was obvious that he was in the area, but the real, real bad news that day was they took the clothes. So now Tom was just about to travel to Dublin. His one and only suit was gone. So luckily a nearby tailor worked all through the night and they had a suit ready for Tom on the morning of the 19th as he set out for his big trip to Dublin. On the 19th, Tom was dropped to Cork Railway Station. He had his suit on, his first class ticket, his medical notes, his textbooks, and some pro-British newspapers. That was a nice touch. So he walked nervously to the platform, passing some British soldiers and black and tans. The kind of men that he's used to ambushing down in West Cork. 
He boarded the train and to look less suspicious, he sat down in a compartment with three other random men. This would look less noticeable than if he was sitting alone. Two of the men looked like businessmen and the other man was a British military officer. After a few minutes, they were all in friendly conversation. The soldier said, quote, I'm going on a spot of leave and I'm not sorry to leave this damned country. Tom Barry told him his very rehearsed script of how he was a medical student in Cork, but he was traveling to Dublin for an examination. Throughout the journey, there was three military inspections, but Tom Barry was absolutely blessed. The British soldier that he'd been chatting to throughout the journey told the inspectors that he was fine. He said, don't worry about him. So Tom didn't have to answer one single question for the entire journey. When Tom arrived in Dublin, his first protocol was to find Jim Kerwin's pub on Parnell Street. The general headquarters had arranged to meet him there. As Tom arrived, Jim brought him into a room to meet Garrod O'Sullivan, the adjutant general of the IRA. Tom and Garrod left basically straight away and headed for Liam Devlin's house nearby in the same street. Tom was brought into a sitting room and to be greeted by Michael Collins, Dermot O'Hegarty and Sean O'Murhala. And the final stop of the day would be where Tom was going to stay for the next six days in Dublin. It was out in the suburbs in Mrs O'Donovan's house. She was an aunt of Garrod. For the six days, Tom Barry, Michael Collins, Garrod O'Sullivan and Sean O'Murhala would stay here together. Each morning, with one or more of the others, Tom would go to the IRA offices in the city centre, which were disguised as everyday, normal businesses. Tom said for the six days, he was never really alone. He spent most of his times with Michael Collins and O'Sullivan. He met about 30 officers, including those of GHQ, the Squad, the Dublin Brigade IRA, Cahill Brewer, and of course, Eamon de Valera. The biggest shock to Tom Barry was the difference in the way of life of the GHQ officers in Dublin compared to the West Cork IRA. They were dressed like businessmen, carrying briefcases, their pockets full of false papers to support their disguise. They had the privilege of sleeping in a house at night. These men seemed to have no fear of getting arrested, or if they had, they certainly didn't show it. Maybe it was because at this stage in the war, Collins and his squad had practically wiped out all of the informers and British intelligence of Dublin Castle. But this kind of life was just unheard of in West Cork. It was a fantasy. Three days previously, Tom was in Skibbereen, sleeping in a tent beside a ditch using it as camouflage. After a few hours sleep, he was awoken to the news that there was an entire column of British soldiers a few hundred yards down the road looking for him by name. Rapidly, he got dressed into his flying column uniform, grabbing his arms, and he was on the run again. What a different life. And to quote Tom Barry himself, their lack of precautions was amazing and even made one angry. But precautions were needed at times. One night, about 9 p.m., Barry alongside Mick Collins, Garrod and Sean were returning to Mrs. O'Donovan's house in the suburbs when they ran into a holdup of about 50 auxiliaries. Just before they were ordered out of the car to be searched, Michael Collins said, act drunk. Collins apparently put on such a good act that the entire group of Augsies were in good humor and laughing. When they got back to the house, Tom was actually really angry. He asked Collins, why on a journey like that would you not send a scout ahead on a bicycle to seek out any British holdups? Collins laughed it off and called him a windy West Cork beggar. Tom was cross. He wasn't used to being searched by Oxies like this or even seeing them or meeting them. The only Oxies that he ever came across were the ones he was trying to kill. Meeting them in person like this was incredibly uncomfortable for him. This kind of stuff just did not happen in Cork. During Tom's trip to Dublin, he had several conversations with IRA Chief of Staff Richard Mulcahy or Dick Mulcahy. Mulcahy was very interested in Barry. He was meticulous in seeking out the details. He asked Barry on questions affecting the organisation, discipline, training and tactics of the IRA in the South. Barry told him that his flying column was severely low in ammunition. He explained that West Cork tactics were generally close quarter attacks. This way they had less chance of missing their target and wasting ammo. Out of all the GHQ staff that Barry met on his trip to Dublin, he said the outstanding figure in all of the GHQ was Michael Collins, the Director of Intelligence. He said that Collins was the backbone of the GHQ. Quote, He was tireless, rootless, dominating man of a great capacity. There was no branch of the army headquarters into which he did not enter. Policy, training, organization, arms, supplies, and propaganda. From all the time that Barry spent with Collins on his trip, he saw many different sides of the man. In one case, he saw his angry and rootless side. One evening, Michael Collins had a meeting with some IRA officers of different brigades from all around the country, and Tom was sitting in on the meetings. One officer of an apparently pretty inefficient unit asked Michael Collins for more arms. Collins, with a scowl on his face and his hands deep in his pockets and his right foot pawing on the ground, shot back and said, what the hell does a lot of lousers like you want arms for? You have rifles and revolvers galore, but you've never used them. A single bowsy like a black and tan walking around your area alone for six months, terrorizing and shooting people, and you're afraid to tackle them. Get the hell out of this and don't come back until you've done some fighting. 
Collins continued to swear as the officer hurriedly left the room. It was no question that Collins had one of the toughest jobs of all. He was a very likeable character and showed great respect to the officers who were doing their best. Whether that officer came from a successful area or an unsuccessful area, Collins showed respect to any man that he knew was trying his best to carry on the fight with the British. Hence why Collins liked Tom Barry so much. Not only was Barry incredibly competent, but he put every ounce of his soul into this fight for independence and never asked for anything in return. Occasionally, Collins was known for challenging lads to wrestle. One night, Tom Barry declined this challenge. Barry said, you're about 16 stone and I'm only 11. Take on O'Murhala or one of the other lads your own weight. But Collins wouldn't accept the refusal. The two lads swayed around the room, grappling. They both fell to the ground and what was supposed to be fun and games became an actual fight. Barry and Collins were fighting on the ground when Garrod O'Sullivan and Sean O'Murhala ran in and pulled them apart. The two men rose angrily and both denied that they had started the fight. Yet in a few minutes, the scowl on Collins' face was gone and he was back smiling. Good-natured Michael Collins was back chatting to Tom Barry. On Barry's third day in Dublin, Collins told him that Carl Brewer, the Minister for Defence, had made an appointment for Barry to meet him. Collins brought Barry along and introduced him and he left immediately afterward. Cahill asked Tom Barry some questions about the struggles in the South. He neither criticised, approved or suggested anything and he used a minimum of words. Tom Barry said that Brewer only ever answered in monosymbols and he was kind of confused by his manner. Eventually, in frustration, Barry began only using monosyllables as well, and there were some awkward silences. Barry was actually really annoyed, but he was trying not to show it. Why the hell did you even schedule this meeting, he thought. Barry came out with that meeting confused, angry, and let's say, not a huge fan of Cahill Brewer. On the morning of the 23rd of May, Michael Collins drove Barry to a very large house in the Dublin suburbs to meet President Eamon de Valera. Barry actually wasn't looking forward to this interview at all. He had mixed feelings about Eamon de Valera. He'd also heard that he was a cold, boring, serious man that never smiled. He had heard that Dev wanted to stop the war against Britain and it was about to accept an offer of a Dominion home rule. Tom thought that Dev was going to hate him. Tom Barry and the 3rd West Corp Brigade were known for being ruthless, unforgiving, aggressive and a competent unit. They had a serious reputation and he thought that Dev's values wouldn't align with his. Barry didn't like this De Valera guy and he was planning on giving him the least amount of information as humanly possible. Michael Collins and Tom Barry walked into De Valera's room, Collins introduced them. Dev and Collins chatted for about 5 minutes about the national loan and then Collins left. Dev began to ask Tom Barry questions about the struggle in the south. After about 10 minutes of chatting, Tom Barry realised everything he had heard about Dev was wrong. He was the opposite. He was smiling, courteous and interested. For two and a half hours, Barry and Dev sat there chatting. Dev listened to every single word that Tom had to say. Tom learned that Dev was far from wanting to stop the fight against the British. He was more interested in developing it, if anything. He questioned Tom closely about the lack of arms and ammunition in Cork. He wanted to know the details of their fights at Kilmichael, Ross Carberry and Cross Barry and he listened closely to what Tom had told him. During their two and a half hour talk, Tom felt like he was chatting to a fellow officer rather than the President of the Irish Republic. Towards the end of their talk, Dev asked all the big questions. How long can the Cork Flying Columns keep the field against the British? Tom Barry replied, quote, No one can answer that question as so much depends on the decision of our enemy and on our ammunition supplies. If for instance the enemy drafted a further 30,000 men in Cork from Britain and were allowed to concentrate on us, and if the GHQ failed to supply 0 .303 ammunition, then the position would be difficult, but not hopeless. The Cork columns might evade the blockade or break through it to operate through Watford, Tipperary, Wexford or up the Midlands or in the west of Ireland, forcing the British to follow and so withdraw the extra troops from Cork. Then we could return again. If large scale British reinforcements were not sent to Cork, we would last another five years. Dev said, you're a very optimistic man and Barry agreed and their talk came to an end. Barry was a big fan of De Valera after his chat. Everything he had heard, everything he had assumed about Dev, was wrong. Tom Barry had planned to leave Dublin for West Cork on the 24th of May, but Collins asked him to stay for another day to see a demonstration of a new submachine gun, the Thompson. Two ex-Irish American army officers had smuggled in two Thompsons into Ireland. If the test was satisfactory, the IRA were going to order 500 more guns. So on the morning of the 24th of May, Tom Barry, Michael Collins and Dick Mulcahy drove to a large unoccupied house in the suburbs of Dublin. When they got there, they met the two Americans and some of the squad. After about 20 minutes, the Thompson was assembled and loaded. They got some bricks and placed them apart against the wall about 20 yards away to use as targets. Collins and Mulcahy were invited to take the honour to be the first person in Ireland to fire this new gun. 
but they offered it to Tom Barry. And Tom was nervous. He was afraid he'd missed the targets in front of the GHQ, in front of the squad. It would have been embarrassing. He didn't want to let West Cork down in front of the GHQ, so he declined it. But after they kept insisting and insisting, he accepted it. He took the Thompson submachine gun, aimed it, and smashed the bricks into smithereens. What a success. But before they left the building, Collins and Mulcahy had decided to purchase 500 more of the Thompson submachine guns. The next day, on the 25th of May, Tom got back on the train and headed for West Cork. And this was the story of Tom Barry's trip to Dublin in May of 1921. I hope you enjoyed this. It's one of my favorite stories from Guerrilla Days in Ireland by Tom Barry. I think it's such a brilliant story because Dublin and West Cork are just so drastically different in the War of Independence. Me personally, I prefer studying the more rural stuff. I love learning about the ambushes in Cork and Tipperary and what was happening in these areas and Limerick and whatnot. And Dublin is just completely different. You know, you have a lot of lads walking around in suits, businessmen type look. It's just a complete, they're two completely different stories. But when you have a West Cork lad being brought to Dublin during the war, it's just brilliant. That's why I love this story so much. And sure, Tom Barry even says it himself. He couldn't get over the everyday life of the GHQ lads in Dublin walking around with suits and briefcases. Tom Barry had the most complete opposite experience of life during the War of Independence, marching in the cold, wet country roads of West Cork, ambushing at all hours in the morning after marching miles upon miles. If he had a bed to sleep in, it was an absolute privilege. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast, lads. As I said, if you want early access to these podcasts, they're available on my Patreon, which will be links below. Thanks a million, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck.